Everyone else, if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I've got the privilege of starting the series off for us this morning, and we're just going to look at the first three verses as we do an introduction to the series. And you may wonder, why is he not covering more? Why is he not going into verse 4? Well, verse 4 says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. And I thought as I read that, you know what? That sounds like a verse for Pastor Joel to talk about. So when he comes back, he can get into the Calvinism and Arminianism debate. But we'll just look at the first three verses this morning. Let me read our passage, and then I'll pray and ask God's blessing on our time together. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray for our time in God's word. Father, we're so grateful that we can be here this morning to hear your word. God, we need the words of 1 Thessalonians in our lives and in our hearts Help us as we strive to grow in our walk with you, to develop our walk with the Lord. And God, I pray that you would just challenge us in how we pray for one another and how we pray for our own spiritual lives. I pray that you would help us to increase our faith as we hear this message, to work on our love that we show to one another, and that we would remain faithful in our hope that you have given us through the gospel. So I pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In February 2021, I adopted a dog. His name is Mac, and I've got some pictures of him on the screen for us. That's how big he was when he was a puppy. He was I didn't really know what he was mixed with. I just knew that he was half beagle, and they said that he could be about 20 pounds. And I remember when he was a puppy, just wanting him to grow up and wanting him to develop a little bit more, to get some more maturity and to not be as playful and excitable. So he eventually did grow up a little bit, and that was a picture of him when he became an adult. But you know what Max's problem was? He didn't know how to stop growing. He went from around 8 pounds to about 20 pounds to 40 pounds, and now he's almost 60 pounds, and he's just not really figured out how to stop growing. And it's interesting when you get a new dog or you watch something else, another animal that has a growth cycle, to see them take those next steps, to see them mature and to continue to grow up. We not only see that with animals, we see that with children as well, their growth stages, how they continue to grow up and mature. In the Christian life, we see that growth and development is called sanctification or progressive sanctification. It means to be set apart, to become less like the world, to become less sinful, and to become more like our Lord Jesus Christ. When we're saved in that moment, God not only redeems us, he not only justifies us, he not only reconciles us, but he initially begins that process. We are initially sanctified, we're initially set apart from sin, set apart to the Lord. But as we all know, we're all still sinful after salvation. We all still struggle with sin. We also have moments where we don't act like we should. We need to continue to grow. And as I begin our study in 1 Thessalonians, we find a church that Paul visits in Acts 17 that has a beautiful salvation story, that has a beautiful story of their reconciliation with the Lord. In fact, turn briefly with me to the book of Acts, Acts 17, as we see... Paul's missionary journey to that city. In Acts 17, starting in verse 1, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob 
and set the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of King Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. What could the apostles have done in Thessalonica to make these Jews say that they'd turn the world upside down? What could they have possibly talked about? What could they have possibly shared with these people? Well, when you look at Acts 17, they were preaching God's word. It said they reasoned with them from the scriptures. They were explaining the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the story of the Thessalonian believers is a story about how the word of God dramatically transformed the believers in this town in the face of persecution. Paul had to leave this city very early in his time there. He was not able to work with them and disciple them like he was with other churches. As we get to this book of 1 Thessalonians, he's writing probably not a long time afterwards, maybe even a couple months He was probably in Corinth. And yet already in their development, we see their love for the Lord. We see them growing in faithfulness. We see this wonderful report that Paul has heard from Timothy. And so he writes to them and he wants them to keep going. He doesn't want them to stop in their development in their Christian walk, but he wants them to continue to grow to become more like Christ. And as Paul writes this book, I believe there's four goals that he has for the Thessalonian believers, and I think they're important for us to understand as we begin this study. He, first of all, wants to stimulate their discipleship. He wants to stimulate their discipleship. This means he wants to keep them going. They've become Christians. That's the first step. They've been growing in their walk with the Lord, but he wants to continue to exhort them to push them further in their walk with God. Throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians, he emphasizes faithfulness, that they have been faithful and that they continue to need faithfulness in their walk with the Lord. We also see the theme of love. Paul has remarked about their love. He remarks later as he says, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for me to write anything to you. This was a very loving congregation, a loving church. But yet Paul wants to push them further. He wants to stimulate their discipleship. Secondly, he wants to comfort them in suffering. As we study this book together, we're going to recognize and realize there was some serious suffering going on, both in persecution from the authorities and in even the loss of loved ones. And Paul wants to comfort them in their suffering. Third, he wants to admonish them to holiness. This means he wants to help them to continue to be sanctified, to be holy, to abstain from sin, to love Jesus better. And then lastly, he wants to correct their understanding of Christ's return. Every chapter of 1 Thessalonians has a reference to the end times, to eschatology as we would talk about it. And you might be a person that's very into the study of the end times. You like thinking about that stuff. You might be a person that says, I don't really want to think about the end times at all. Whatever side you may fall on, the end times should not just be a subject for debate. It should actually be something that encourages us that helps our walk with the Lord. And so 1 Thessalonians focuses on that and helps us understand the Lord's return. And so I invite us this morning, as we look at just these three verses, our goal for this sermon is to develop our walk with God, to take the next step, to push ourselves further in our walk with the Lord. We're going to look at two ways that we can begin to do this, two ways that Paul shows us in this letter. But before we get to those, look at verse 1 with me. I want us to make some initial observations about this verse as it introduces the letter. It says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Paul follows his normal introduction to a book that he's writing, and he has this three-part greeting. He first will introduce the writer, and it's himself. It's Silvanus, which is probably another name for Silas. 
And then it's Timothy. Timothy, we know, is Paul's protege. He's very close with Paul. He also visited the church of Thessalonica later on, as we see in this book. We then see that he's writing to the Thessalonians, to this church here that he had left only a few months earlier. And then we see the last part, grace to you and peace. Grace we know which we've received from the Lord. Grace is the gift of God in salvation. And then peace is the result of that. We have peace with God and we have peace with others as well. Then as we get to verse 2, we see the first way that we can develop our walk with God. And it's through prayer. It's through prayer. Look at verse 2 with me. It says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. We're going to look at four different aspects of Paul's prayer and how it encourages us in our prayer life to develop our walk with the Lord. I first want us to see this theocentric prayer. You might say, why is he using such a big word? It's early in the morning. Well, I'll be honest with you, and I'm going to throw Joel under the bus since he's not here. I went to Joel's office. I said, I need to think of another word besides theocentric. And he said, no, that's a great word. You know, you need to push their vocabulary a little bit. You need to use that word in your sermon. So if you don't like this word, you need to take it up with Pastor Joel, who's in some kind of food coma right now from his weekend with his wife. This word just means God-centered. To have our prayers God-focused. And you might think, well, duh, it's God who we're praying to. Yes, but so often in our prayer life, we're focused on ourselves. Lord, would you help me? Can I have this? And we spend very little time talking about God. But if you look at the prayer life of Paul, what you will find is he is very God-centered in the way that he prays. We'll get some of these examples of his prayer with me. First of all, in Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. God's hope, the hope that he gives us, encourages us to have hope in our walk with him. Secondly, we see in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. God comforts us. He is a comforting God. And then in verse 4, it will say, He comforts us so that we can comfort others as well. In Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Elections talked about in that passage too, but we're not going to talk about that this morning. In Ephesians 3, 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work in us. We have a powerful God. His power should be on our mind as we pray to him. And then finally, in Philippians 1, 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. God started this work of salvation in us. He's going to finish the work of of salvation in our lives. So we notice Paul's view of God. It is theocentric. It's God-focused. He focuses on the attributes of God in his prayers. He affirms God's power, his grace, his sovereignty, his love, and his goodness. And friends, this morning our prayers desperately need to be God-focused. And what do I mean by that? Your view of God will play itself out in your prayer life. If you believe in the love of God, then on the days when you feel most unloved, you will pray for his love in your life. If you believe in the grace of God, then on the days when you feel the most undeserving, you will petition God for his grace. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, then when your life feels like it's spinning out of control, you will ask God for his sovereignty. If you believe in the justice of God, then when someone has wronged you, when someone has done injustice to you, you will remember God's justice. And when you believe in the goodness of God, as we see our dark and broken world, you will remember that God is good, that he gives us good gifts. Amen? Amen. We need to understand our great God as we pray. And so as we go to him in prayer, remember who your God is, affirm his attributes, worship him in prayer. Secondly, we want to have thankful prayer, thankful prayer. We notice in Paul's prayer here in verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you. This is a very thankful prayer. He's thankful for the Thessalonians here. 
He immediately begins to thank God for this church. And almost every letter that Paul writes, he expresses his thankfulness for the church. There's only one letter that he doesn't do that in. It's the book of Galatians. And it's because they had so compromised the gospel in that church that he had to get right down to business and say, I'm so astonished that you would abandon the gospel so quickly. Notice also that it says, I'm thankful for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. No one is left out. He doesn't just say, I'm thankful for most of you, or there's people in your church that I'm thankful for. He's thankful for everyone. And I don't know the church in Thessalonica personally, but I'm going to guess there were some people there that could have had some issues, that could have been problems. But Paul found a way to be thankful for all of them. And in our prayers, we should be thankful. We should not just bring God a wish list or a complaint list. Our prayers should be focused not only on who God is, but in thankfulness for what he has done for us. If you cannot think of ways that you can be thankful to the Lord, then you desperately need a reality check in your life because you do not realize all that God has given you to be thankful for. Do you realize this morning that none of us would be here, none of us could listen to this sermon, none of us could grow in our walk with the Lord if it was not for his grace and the good gifts that he has given us. We should be thankful in our prayers. Thirdly, we should be consistent in our prayers. Notice these words. I give th- we give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. This is the idea of praying without ceasing. Now, does that just mean Paul prayed all the time and he never took any breaks? I don't necessarily think that's true, but I think it shows us that his prayer was constant. It was consistent. Daily, morning and evening, he prayed to the Lord. And consistency in prayer is difficult to achieve. We don't have to raise hands, but how many of you struggle to consistently go to the Lord in prayer? The people in my life that I think, man, they just have this great prayer walk, this great walk with the Lord where they pray every day. They will tell me, you know what, I think I need to do better. I think I need to pray more. The people who say, well, I've got prayer figured out. I don't need to work on being consistent in prayer. Those are usually the people that could probably spend more time in prayer. What are we doing when we're praying daily? Well, we're daily going to the Lord and saying, I can't do this on my own. I need you and your strength and your power in my life. Charles Spurgeon said this about prayer. Prayer and praise are the oars by which a man may row his boat to the deep waters of the knowledge of Christ. What's interesting about my own walk with the Lord in prayer, I find it hard to pray Yet there are so many situations in my life where I think, you know what? I'm not smart enough to deal with this. I don't have the right answer for this situation. And so why I can't connect those two that, hey, I need this prayer in my life. I need to go to the Lord, but yet I'm not consistent in my prayer life. I don't understand, but we recognize we need to be consistent in prayer. And then finally, I want us to see intentional prayer intentional prayer. Paul is praying for the believers in Thessalonica. He mentions them here. This means to mention by name. Think about all the missionary journeys that Paul took, all the churches that he prayed for, and how many people, how long his prayer list must have been. And yet Paul is consistently praying for this church. He's consistently mentioning them by name. But I want us to notice he's not just focused on physical circumstances. And I want to be careful It is not wrong to pray for physical things. In our prayer list at our church, we have many physical needs that we pray for, and that is a good thing for us to do. But he often looks beyond the physical to the spiritual needs of the churches he's praying for. And two examples come to my mind. First of all, in Ephesians 1, 16 and 17, it says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What is he praying for? That they would grow in their walk with God. That they would continue to grow in how much knowledge they have of him and their awareness of God and his presence. Then Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ to the glory and praise of God. Friends, we desperately need to capture what Paul does here in prayer, not just praying for the physical, but praying for the spiritual as well. Think about your relationships with people in our church. 
How often do you go to them and not just say, I'm praying for you in this physical need in your life, but ask how you can pray for them spiritually. Ask how they are doing in their walk with the Lord. I think if that's awkward for us or if that's not natural for us, we might need to ask ourselves more questions about why that is. It shouldn't be an awkward thing for us to ask about our spiritual lives to those who we go to church with. And so Paul is saying he's praying for them, not just in physical ways, but in spiritual ways as well. And we should do the same thing. Friends, these are marks of a healthy prayer life. If we want to develop our walk with the Lord, we need to pray. Unfortunately, prayer is often the last resort that we go to, the last thing that we do. And sometimes it's because of our pride. We think that we can handle our problems on our own. We think that we can handle the situations in our life, that we can meet our own needs. But Christian maturity is not found in trying to solve your own problems. Christian maturity is found in going to the Lord with the issues that you have, acknowledging that all the power that we need comes from him. So let me challenge us to not only pray for ourselves, but to pray for others as well. Use our prayer sheet and our bulletin. Reach out, develop relationships with one another so that you can pray for them physically and spiritually. Let's be challenged this morning to develop our walk with God in prayer. We secondly want to develop our walk with the Lord through action, through action. In 1 Thessalonians 1.3, we read, Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What we see here are three virtues that Paul emphasizes throughout his letters, faith, hope, and love. And he'll talk about these time and time again, either using all three of them or using just two of the three. In Colossians 1, verses 4 and 5, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, in verse 5, because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of, the God of truth, the gospel. Faith, hope, and love. It's used constantly by Paul. It's used in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now, these three, now, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. In Ephesians 3, 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Colossians 1, 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shipping, shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And then finally, 1 Timothy 1, 14, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. These three virtues, faith, hope, and love, are used so often in Paul's writings but why is that so? Why does he focus on these virtues? And what I think they show us is not only their character, but the actions they take as well. This faith, hope, and love in action. And we want to look at these three. First of all, this faith. Faith displayed by works. He says your work of faith. This word for work means proof or a practical demonstration of your faith. It reminds me of what James says in James 2, 17. So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And it's not a works-based salvation. That's what, not what we're talking about this morning. We don't do good works to be saved. But rather, because we're saved, it leads to us doing works. The Thessalonians were working, and their faith was so evident through their works that it stands out to Paul, that it was evident throughout the entire region they were living in. And this idea of faith here has two different aspects to it. First of all, it's a commitment that we think about, their faith in the Lord, their belief in Him, but it also is shown in their faithfulness as well. You believe in the Lord in salvation, then through your Christian life you show faithfulness. What do you think of when you think of faithfulness? What people stand out in your life that make you think that's a faithful person? Sometimes it's people who are up in front who have been doing things in front of people for years, famous pastors or Christian singers. In my mind, it's often the people who are in the background. We had a lady at the last church that we were in. She would not want any public recognition for what she did. 
But if it were not for her, our church would not be around. She prepared communion. She would pick up cleaning supplies. She would get snacks for VBS. There were so many things that she did. In fact, if she were to randomly just miss a Sunday, I don't know if the church could have gone on. She was such a faithful person. And we need to be faithful this morning, not just in ways that are big and outward that everyone can see, but to be faithful in that which is little as well, in the little things that God has called us to, in the moments of our Christian life that no one else pays attention to. Think about all the responsibilities and relationships in your life as a parent or child, as a spouse, husband or wife, as a Christian. Are you faithful in the relationships God has given you? Think about the first and second greatest commandments. Do you love the Lord your God? with all your heart, soul, and mind? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Are you faithful in the service God has called you to? Are you faithful in this church, not only to attend, but to serve one another, to encourage one another? Friends, faithfulness is displayed through our work, outwardly showing faithfulness to others. Faithfulness in the life of a growing Christian is a sign that you are developing in your walk with God. Faithful Christians are vital members of a church that Paul would be thankful for. Are you faithful this morning? Secondly, notice love displayed by labor. We see this phrase, labor of love. And it kind of has the same idea, this word labor has almost the same idea as work, but it's a more strenuous aspect. It's interesting that we would find this strenuous word for labor or exertion right next to agape love. How is love strenuous. Well, love should be sacrificial. Love should be giving of yourself for someone else. What I think Paul is referring to is self-sacrificial actions for others in his ch- in your church. The Thessalonian church so quickly displayed a genuine love for one another that it was not just in their words, but it was in their actions as well. So much so that it became known to the entire region of churches that were there. For those of you who are married, think about the first time you said, I love you to your spouse, where you were, how old you were, what it meant to you then. And think about your marriage now and how much that idea of love has grown and has developed and has changed. Some of you have been married for years and almost decades. Some of you have been married for not as long. My wife and I are fairly recently married, but even in our short marriage, what it meant to say, I love you when we first said it, And what it means to say I love you now is different. Your relationship grows and you don't find out less. You find out more about one another and you have more opportunities to sacrifice for each other in love. Now, love for your church is different than love for your spouse. But as members of the same church, we should be displaying our love for each other through sacrificial actions. Do you take time to express your love for others? And do you love everyone? Not just the people who you get along with the best, not just the people who you have the same interests in, but you take time to love the least of these, the people who you may not interact with as much. Sacrificial love in the life of a growing Christian is a sign that you're developing your walk with God. And loving Christians are a vital part of a church that Paul would be thankful for. Are you growing in love? And then finally, we see hope displayed by endurance, your endurance of hope. And the word for endurance means to hold up under difficulty or stress. It could be translated as patience or steadfastness. And what we see about the Thessalonian church in Acts 17 was that they faced persecution. They faced suffering, opposition from the moments they became Christian. It was not a popular thing in that city. In fact, they probably had to hide the fact that they were, Christ- that they were Christians. But what kept them going, what helped them to endure, what kept the church alive was hope. And we use this word hope in our society today and in our day and age, and I don't think we quite understand biblical hope. You and your wife or husband go to McDonald's and you say, I hope the milkshake machine is going to work. When you know what? It's not going to work. You go to a restaurant and you say, I hope the food is good. And if you see a fly flying around or a cockroach under the table, you don't have a lot of hope that the food's going to be good. I'm a Bears fan here. We've got Vikings fan. Poor Chris is a Cowboys fan over there. 
when we say, I hope our teams are going to be good, what do we know? They're probably not going to be good this season. So we don't use hope in our society the way that Scripture uses hope. Hope is not a wishing for the best, but it is a confident expectation in what is going to happen. When we talk about hope, when Paul uses hope here with the Thessalonians, it's people understanding what God has already done for them in salvation, but also what he will do in the future. Our hope is found not in thinking that this life is our best life now, but in recognizing that our best life is yet to come when we're face to face with the Lord. Hope is what keeps us going. We can have faith. We can be faithful in our works. We can have love for one another. But if we don't have hope, we will eventually wear out. It is hope that I think kept them pressing on, kept them patient, kept them enduring through this suffering. I'm reminded of the church of Smyrna in Revelation 2. They were facing immense persecution. And Jesus writes to them in the letters to the seven churches, and he says, I know the persecution that you faced, but the encouragement he gives them is interesting. He doesn't say it's going to get better. In fact, he says it's going to get worse. He says, some of you will be thrown in prison. Some of you will die for the faith. And the encouragement he gives them is to be faithful to death. How would you like that? If I came here and preached a sermon and said, well, you're, you're under persecution. Some of you might die, but just be faithful to death. Where is the hope in that? Well, it's found in the next phrase when he says, be faithful to death and I will give you a crown of life. It's a reminder that our hope is in the return of Christ and spending eternity with him and seeing him face to face if you're struggling in your walk with God this morning, if you find it difficult to keep growing in your walk with the Lord as a Christian, then you need hope. You need to be reminded of what God has already done for you in the gospel and in what is waiting for you in heaven as you see Jesus face to face. Are you patiently awaiting Christ's coming? Are you faithful as you run the race that has been set before you? Hope-filled Christians are vital members of a church that Paul would be thankful for. These three remain, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. These are actions of godly character. If you're trying to grow in your walk with the Lord and you say, I need to grow in these actions, then be encouraged. Commit to developing your relationship with God. As we close this morning, I want to remind us of the hope we have in the return of Christ. A couple times a week, I've been going down to the fitness center at our apartment building. I go very early in the morning so no one can see what I'm trying to do on the treadmill. I would call it running, but it's not really running. It's more like jogging or some kind of hurt animal trying to run on the treadmill. And as I get on the treadmill, I try to do at least a mile, maybe a couple miles, but I always take a break after the first one. And I get on there, and the hardest part for me is not the first half mile. I can run that. I've still got some energy. And it's not the end of running, but it's from about half a mile to three quarters of a mile. And for some reason during that time, I'm the most tempted to slow down the speed, to try to walk, to take a break, to even quit. But I know if I can get past three quarters of a mile, I'll make it to the end of the mile. And then I'll go like lay down on the floor or something for a while. And what's the point of that? It's not to watch me run while I'm on the treadmill. It's to remind us that if we need encouragement, if we need hope in our walk with the Lord, if you find yourself this morning saying, you know what, I need to develop in my walk with the Lord. I need to grow in my knowledge of Christ, but it's hard. It's difficult right now. Remember the return of Christ. And I don't want to steal Joel's thunder for what's coming later, but in verse 10, we're reminded in chapter 1, of Christ who is coming. He's called the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And we don't know when the Lord is coming back. I believe it could be at any moment where we could be reunited with him in heaven. And so that is what keeps us going. We don't know when the end of the race is, but we do know what's going to happen when we're there and what it will be like to be with Christ, reunited with him in heaven. So the knowledge of that should encourage us to develop our walk with God. It should push us on like we're nearing the end of the race. It should cause us to be more faithful 
and what the Lord has called us to. It should remind us to be loving towards one another, even when it's difficult or hard. It should remind us to have hope when we feel like giving up. The hope of the Christian life is one day we will meet Jesus face to face, and he will deliver us from the wrath to come. So this morning, church, run the race that is set before us in the strength of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this book of 1 Thessalonians. We pray that you would help us to grow in our knowledge of you, to develop our relationship with you. I pray that you would help us to do that in our prayer, that we'd be consistent in prayer, that you would help us to focus our prayers on you, that you would encourage us to pray for one another as well. Father, help us to be consistent in these actions as well, to be faithful even when it's hard, when no one is watching, to love one another well, even self-sacrificially, and to remember the hope that we have in you. We pray now for the Lord's table, that you would bless us as we remember what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done for us on the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen.